we're going to introduce Margot Patukian. So I've heavily redacted their bios. They were extremely long, um, which reflects experience and CV, but it becomes a little boring in sort of sessions like tonight. So um, Margot is the Chief Medical Officer of MLS. So many of you I know work in football. She's a former Director of Athletic Medicine and Head Team Physician at Princeton University, past President of the AMSSM, um, served as a team physician for the US Men's National Lacrosse Team. Anyone like lacrosse? No one, good. Um, <laughs> currently is the team physician for the US, the, the under 20 women's and women's national team, soccer team. So we're kind of hoping that she might be down here next year for that as well. Um, and one of the things that's interesting for tonight's session is that she's been the co-author of a number of team physician consensus statements, including the AMSSM position statements on concussion and mental health, and the IOC mental health and elite athlete statement. Um, she's also been an invited participant and co-author at the Zurin, Zurich Berlin and the recently held Amsterdam um, International Concussion and Sport Group Conferences. So I think that's probably enough, Margot. So um, it's my absolute pleasure to invite you up here. I'm not sure quite where we are with... Uh, oh, I wasn't really prepared for this. Return to play. Return to play. There we go. Thank you. you oh. But before we start, uh, I just on a behalf of myself and Tina and Siobhan, um, you, you are coming to the United States. It's just a matter of when, right? So your, your time to be a fellow is not done. Uh, but it's been an absolute um, pleasure for us to be here. And um, Mark's been an incredible host. Um, you should see him, you know, like you should have opened the bottles in the back with a with a, a yeah, yeah exactly I can open champagne with a sword <laughs> yeah. but this is just a small token of our for the clinic well, uh, of our appreciation very much for everything um, I think Margot's given me this because one of the things I redacted is that she's the the editor of this <laughs> fine publication so yeah. anyway one of them one thank of them. you very much you bet you bet all right, so um, I'm going to talk uh, like 20 minutes on return to play because it's a, it's a really topic of, of mine that I, that I really enjoy. Um, and um, there's a little bit of a twist to it, and it's really case-based, so hopefully you'll kind of get a little bit of a flavor of how I got interested in concussion. Um, so again, I mean, I think we all know that injury and illness is common, and, and return to play is... Um, decisions are, are made based on a variety of frameworks and, and criteria and I, uh, in talking to, to some of you tonight I, I understand that you do a lot of that right you make a lot of those decisions uh, working with your athletes and your teams and and certainly understanding the science is critical right you have to understand the nature of the injury and, the, and, the, and or the illness uh, the factors that are specific to the athlete as well as the the sport in terms of making those decisions um, but I think it's important that we think about other factors, uh, and that really what's, is what really is the, the art of medicine as opposed to um, just the science. So, um, you know, when I first started my career, it was at Penn State University, which is a pretty big sporting school uh, in the United States. And one of the uh, first athletes that I had, my, I happened to, to date, I'm now married to the baseball coach, um, but. Um, one of the issues that we had was an athlete that had um, bloody diarrhea. And so we ended up working him up and he was diagnosed with uh, Crohn's colitis. And um, the, the physician basically said to me, the, the gastroenterologist said, well, he can't play. It's obvious he can't play. And I go, well, wait a minute, why? I mean, we've controlled, he's not bleeding anymore. He's hemodynamically stable and, and he's a pitcher. And he said, well, you know, they got to run, they got to do this, they got to do that. And I said, well, we're, we're the, I'm the team doctor. I can, we can basically limit what he does activity-wise, and he should be able to play. And it really is, um, I mean, I think that decision in terms of when, it, when is it safe, uh, when is it not safe, uh, I'm a, again, we always think about the evidence, um, and we want to have a, a shared decision as we, as we are working with our athletes. But, you know, who makes that decision? Who is it up to? Is it the specialist? Is it the, the GP? Um, is it the physio? Uh, and then what are the rules and policies that might be in place? And it's really when my interest in, um, in primary care sports medicine was, was sort of fuel because you're always asking the question, what's the effect of the exercise on, on disease? Like what's the effect of exercise on someone that's got Crohn's? 
Uh, and then vice versa. What's the effect of the disease uh, in terms of its, its role with someone that participates in exercise? So that's really how I kind of got interested in this whole return to play. And um, when I was uh, a resident, um, I interacted with uh, Tim Quill. And I'm not sure if, if anybody uh, here knows of Tim Quill, but Tim Quill ended up writing this, um, this sounding board article called Death and Dignity. Um, and he ended up uh, basically um, prescribing bar barbiturates to a patient who had um, uh, cancer and didn't want to be treated. So, you know, he literally saw her for a rash and fatigue, ended up getting uh, blood work, uh, and it was, um, it was, it was significant. Her white, her white cell count was, was 4.3, her hematocrit was uh, 22. And so he ended up calling her and explaining things, and, you know, she said, well, wait a minute, don't, don't tell me it could be cancer. And he thought, well, I, I wish I didn't have to, but that's his role as a doctor, right? So, and long story short, she ended up having um, a, a, a blood cancer, and it would, would be treated. It could be treated. But she decided that she didn't want treatment. Uh, and so even though as hard as that was for for him to sort of go through the science and say, well, wait a minute, you know, 25% of the time it's, it's successful and you can have a long-term cure. And she said, I, I don't want treatment. Uh, she then came back in and wanted to talk to him about um, getting um, barbiturates for sleep, but he knew well that she really wanted to sort of end her life the way that she wanted to end her life. So long story short, uh, or not so short, um, he ended up meeting with her. He had her get a second opinion and um, subsequently did prescribe uh, her barbiturates knowing that she was gonna, when the time was right, she was going to take, take her own life. And he ended up having to go, uh, go, to, go to court and fight uh, and fight for the, the right to be able to do that. Um, but what, why this ties into me is that literally um, he brought her into our, our resident rounds and, and spoke to, had her come in and actually talk about, you know, how important it is for, for patients to be able to have a say in their treatment. Um, and again, as a young resident, I was, you know, most of us were like, wait a minute, you should, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you be treated? You have a 25% chance of being cured. Uh, but it was really an important lesson for me in terms of the importance of having, uh, being an advocate for your patients and, and trying to figure out um, how, to, how, to make it, how to make it work for them. Um, so my second and third cases, and this is part of the reason I ended up being interested in concussion. Um, one was uh, probably really early in my career, a basketball player turned and she got elbowed in the temple and was knocked unconscious. Uh, by the time I got out onto the court, one pupil's big, one pupil's small, uh, she was unconscious. She came to and she said, my, my head really hurts. And she couldn't move her left upper extremity and she was weak in her left flexor, hip flexor. Uh, we ended up um, boarding her, brought her to the hospital, CAT scans normal of her, of her brain and her, and her neck, MRI scan next day normal of her brain and her, and her neck. Her weakness resolved after a few hours. At the time, the guidelines were you kept somebody out for a month. So she was out for a month and then came back to play. And when she came back to play, she got hit again and had ringing in her ears. Um, and um, she was having trouble with... Uh, with naming things. So she'd say, you know, like we had chalk. So <laughs> I know I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> chalk at the chalkboard. And she'd go up and she'd pick it up with the opposite hand. Uh, and she would have trouble naming things like it's, it's, a, it's not a pencil, but it's something else that you write with. And she couldn't come up with pen. So I ended up sending her to a neuropsychologist and they did a bunch of tests and um, turned out that she um, ended up having some deficits that we weren't sure whether they were baseline or not. And so we actually started our program at, at, at Penn State University at that time, looking at neuropsychological testing, which are you know, very comprehensive tests that look at brain behavior um, relationships. Um, but one of the things that I, I asked her at one point was, how do you feel about you know, returning to play? And she's like, well, <laughs> to be honest, I'm scared. She said, like, every time I, I, I try to, you know, every time I go back and, and play basketball, I lose something. I get hurt, and then I lose something, and I'm afraid I'm not going to get it back. 
And so the lesson that th that taught me outside of all that I've learned about neuropsychology was um, how important it is to ask your patients how they feel about, you know, are they apprehensive and are they, you know, how are they feeling about returning to sport? And I think it's one of the things that, you know, stuck with me. The other uh, basketball player that I took care of, which is, um, which, which was a challenge, was uh, a player who had had a subdural when he was eight years old. He got hit in the head with a baseball bat. It had blood. They had drained it uh, surgically. And then he ended up, you know, having no issues through uh, the rest of elementary school and, and high school and played sports. And so we had to make the decision, is it okay for him to play at university at a, a scholarship level? And we ended up saying uh, yes. And then he ended up having a, a concussion uh, his first year where he felt, um, couldn't remember the, the, where we had played and, and the, had difficulty with memory. So he, stay, he spent the entire year at the end of the bench sitting next to me. And my name's Patukian. Uh, Kevorkian was in the news. I don't know if you remember. Kevorkian was the guy that was assisting, helping to assist uh, people commit suicide. And so uh, he used to call me Kevork. I was like, hey, Kevork. So he gets hurt again. And literally, um, I show up at the hospital. And he doesn't know who I am. And he doesn't know who his teammates are. And, um, you know, everything's otherwise okay. Uh, I call his parents and they say, well, should we, should we send him, you know, should we, come should we come from Tulsa? And I'm like, no, just let's just see how he does the next day. The next day, walk in, he still doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know his teammates. He doesn't know he's in college. He doesn't know uh, that he went on a blind date um, a couple nights before. Uh, and this persisted for six days. I'd never seen anything quite like it, and that's really part of the reason I ended up interested in, in, uh, in concussion. So, um, you know, your role as a, as a team doctor, this is sort of what the team physician consensus statement uh, first said, you know, the process of deciding when an athlete is ready, uh, and they should be familiar with this process. Um, they should be able to evaluate the athlete. Um, they should be able to be familiar with treatment and rehabilitation and then finally make that decision as it relates to return to play. Um, shortly thereafter, the Canadians uh, looked at what, what the team physician consensus statement had come up with and came up with this model that many of you may have seen previously. It's by Creighton. And it's um, a three-step process of return to play, taking into account medical factors, sport factors, and then decision modifiers. Um, we updated our, the team physician consensus statement in 2012, and at that point we took a lot of the issues that were, were brought up in that start um, uh, process and, um, again, looked at uh, the, the major issues in terms of making return to play decisions. Um, and we added some areas where it was, you know, a little bit less, less spelt out, um, and that was primarily the psychological readiness piece. And so that was really taken into account that there are a lot of emotional reactions that occur when an athlete is injured uh, and that we have to take into account um, their fear of being injured again. Um, we have to sort of uh, account for the fact that they may feel quite isolated um, and then also their autonomy. So, you know, certainly the pressures that athletes may feel in terms of returning too quickly. Um, shortly thereafter, the START framework was published, and again, this is very similar to the, that Creighton model, um, where again, you're taking uh, an assessment of health and activity, um, comparing um, the, the, the risk, um, as well as taking into account what the athlete's risk tolerance is. You know, what are they willing, what risks are they willing to take? Um, and, and again, this is a framework that I think may, may be familiar to, to many folks because it's been well-established in the literature. Uh, Claire Ardern um, asked uh, uh, critical questions as it relates to return to play and, you know, kind of looking at the combination or the overlap between, again, the evidence, uh, the physician, and then the athlete uh, and trying to sort out what, what makes sense. Uh, and the five questions, you know, is how does the clinician determine when an athlete's ready? You know, integrate the best evidence with the, the preferences of the patient, 
Um, you try to use some kind of a, a clinical criteria, but understand that there's a huge gap a lot of times in a lot of areas for a lot of areas, uh, for a lot of injuries. Um, so there's a huge knowledge gap in terms of what we really know about the science. Um, you know, is physical recovery uh, uh, alone it enough? And again, that's the whole piece of psychological readiness. And how do we define successful return to play? Is it how the, the surgeon defines it or is it how the athlete defines it? And, and um, I think that's an important question. And then also, uh, what are the responsibilities of our, of our physicians and our, uh, the other folks making these decisions? Is, it, are, is the patient the, the number one responsibility or do you have a responsibility to, to the university uh, that, you, that you may work for, the team that you may, that you may work for? And then finally, should the athlete even return to play? And being able to balance uh, the autonomy of the athlete who says, I'm fine, I want to play with, uh, with what we feel is good practice or safe for the athlete. Um, we have to remember that there are conflicts of interest, right? Physicians a lot of times have a legal liability. Uh, for, for Major League Soccer, for example, you know, our, our physicians are the ones that have the legal liability. Our athletic trainers, which are very similar to the physios here, uh, work under the plan of care of a, of, of a physician. So if something goes wrong, it's all on the, all on the physician's you know, legal liability. Um, and you, know, you certainly want to protect uh, the, the, the patient. That's the number one, number one issue. Uh, but again, if you're employed by um, a university or a club, then a lot of times you also have a responsibility to mitigate risk for, for that, for that uh, institution. And then finally, you know, there are some situations where there may be rules that you have to comply with in order to, you know, if someone has a concussion in, in rugby, there, you know, there's a, a certain period of time that they have to stand down. Uh, and so there may be guidelines that you have to follow in that regard. Um, you know, at least in the United States, and I, I imagine uh, everywhere in the world now, we're really looking at uh, all different ways to, to monitor performance and athlete monitoring. And uh, this article from Tim Gabbett is really fantastic because it's, it just, it dummies it down for someone like me to be able to understand all that goes on as it relates to, to monitoring. Uh, and this model is really one of the ones that, uh, that I think he presented that is uh, an excellent framework that again looks at sort of, you know, what's the athlete's response to a load? And then how do we uh, respond to that? How, did the, how does the athlete cope? Uh, and then how does that, you know, kind of circle back as it relates to workload. Uh, the other thing that, that's come um, uh, full, you know, full force is uh, wearable technology and the analytics that go with it. And we're seeing this all over the place and it's certainly an opportunity for uh, clinicians and engineers and data scientists to be able to work together and collaborate. Um, the, this article talked about sort of the, the six different thrusts towards being able to reduce the, the burden of injury. Um, and again, uh, it's important that we're getting accurate data and being able to, um, you know, apply that for athlete safety and performance. And a lot of times we're looking at, I was with our, with our women's team and um, we were talking to the data scientists about an athlete's uh, data. And we're like, I don't know if we can, can trust it. There's no way. There's no way she's run, running that fast, right? So you have to be able to be able to interpret it and make sure that it's accurate. So there's, there, there are these four sort of models that are out there as it, as it relates to return to play. The, the start model that I, that I started off with. Um, and then Claire Ardern has done uh, a fair bit as it relates to um, return to sport for uh, sports physical therapy um, and also the psychological response to injury uh, and then finally the the Gabbett uh, workload framework. Um, there are other approaches to uh, sports injuries and again this is something that I think many of us in the room probably deal with when you're talking about let's say ACL injury and if you're thinking about all the different risk factors for um, for athletes, their age, um, what they, what sport, their load, um, it may be different for an athlete that's a you know a field hockey player versus someone that's a, a gymnast, right? So those different, they have different uh, weights as it relates to how much of a risk factor it might be for that particular athlete. So it's being able to take that into effect as well. 
And, um, you know, medicine really is a science, right? A science of uncertainty and an art of probability. So uh, this is a, a case that, you know, I'm going to preface this by saying that this happened in 2005. So it was way early in my Princeton career, and it was a water polo athlete that had dizziness. Um, had, he had had a history of uh, syncope four years prior, and he'd had a workup at that time. He was in high school in Hawaii. Uh, and he'd had an, a, a pretty decent workup at that time. His, his uh, uh, neighbor was a cardiologist, and he spoke to him and just said this is what was going on, and his cardiologist th thought, maybe you're just out of shape, and he just had that workup not that long ago, um, and d didn't think much of it. Um, he then comes to, um, he, he has, uh, he comes to Princeton, and he literally has a, an episode where he feels like he's going to pass out, gets out of the pool, proceeds to pass out. So then he comes to our, our um, the, the health center, and we repeat his evaluation. So we do a, an electrocardiogram, we do a, a lab, some labs, uh, we do an echocardiogram, and they're all normal. Uh, we, the cardiologist um, wanted to get a tilt test, which, you know, markedly reproduced his symptoms. Um, so I, I guess the question would be, are we done? Would you guys clear him? Is he, go, is he ready to go back in the pool? Anybody say, yeah, good, good to go, good workup? Anybody want something else? All right. Well, we ended up getting a stress test. So his electrocardiogram is normal. It's got normal intervals. Um, his rhythm strip is normal. Um, and he does a stress test. And the cardiologist calls me and says, you know, this is one of your typical Princeton athletes. He, he made it all the way through. And it was only in, in recovery that he started having some issues. Um, so he has a couple runs of, you see a couple episodes here of VT, right? Two, two, two beats, three beats, then he has this. So he has, you know, eight, ten beats of ventricular tachycardia, wide space um, rhythm abnormality. So we, at that point, disqualify him from sport. We ended up getting a, um, a cardiac MRI, which was, at least in the United States, very novel. You don't, we don't, it was brand new to get cardiac MRI. Uh, it was felt to be normal. He had an electrophysiology study um, and, again, had no pre-excitation. He didn't have any abnormalities on that. Uh, the, then proceeded the cardiologist put in an implantable loop monitor, a recorder, to sort of monitor his heart. Right? And over time, he was doing fine. He had no symptoms. Uh, so at, at the two-month mark, they uh, said that he could get back in the pool and just start to swim. But he's having no episodes, nothing. No dizziness, nothing. And then when they download what the loop recorder was measuring, and it was, it was, it was normal, no, no ab abnormalities. Finally, at six months, he was cleared to return to full play. And he came back in for his... Uh, follow-up physical, which is a year later now in August, and he had no issues at all with preseason, but then pre-preseason, uh, but then in preseason got a little bit dizzy. So pre-preseason isn't a typo. We have at, at Princeton, you sort of the athletes get together before they show up on campus, because they're only allowed to come to campus, you know, late. So they get together on their own. And during pre-preseason, he was fine, but then when he showed up on campus started getting dizzy again. And I said, well, when, <laughs> when's the next time you're going to download your monitor? And he said, well, it's, it's like in a week or so. And I said, yeah, let's do it now. Let's, let's, let's move that up. So um, this is from one of his episodes of being dizzy. Um, not good, right? Even the surgeons in the room probably can go, this is not good. And uh, same thing. So he had monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is not, not a good rhythm, not a good rhythm. Uh, and it literally started, here's where it starts, and there's where it ends. So um, he actually had a defibrillator placed, and um, before it was placed, they repeated the cardiac MRI, and there was a suggestion that there might be a little bit of um, uh, inflammation and felt to be a myocarditis. So that was his uh, final diagnosis. And um, we, dis we disqualified him from sport. He was a senior. 
Um, and at the time, the guidelines for cardiology, the cardiologists, would say that you know you shouldn't have a defibrillator and play competitive, you know, elite sport. So that was part of the reason that we disqualified him. Um, and uh, again, that that uh, that might be different if we were seeing him now, and we'll talk about that. So um, again, I think this is an article that Dr. Bagish wrote related to shared decision making in in terms of cardiovascular disease, um, and. Uh, I think it's, it's phenomenal because it talks a little bit about uh, the previous guidelines related to um, cardiovascular conditions, you know, and uh, for, the most, for the most part, um, whenever you had anything that would be potentially life-threatening, um, there was a 0% chance of allowing an athlete back into play. Um, I, and now, to play cricket though, Margo. What's that? Cricket was 1A. So. 1A, that's right, unless you, that, that's true. That's, mm. that's some of the sports that you, golf and cricket. Cricket's 1A. Was. Wow. Yeah. So we went to the cricket in Adelaide. So cricket is probably not all cricket is 1A. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it's, it's a pretty high exertion, I'm surprised. Yeah. Because I mean, the other sports are golf <coughs> and bowling. Probably wasn't. <laughs> yeah. That's 10 pin bowling, right? Yeah, yeah 10 pin bowling. Yeah. No, you're not bowling. Lawn no, bowls. Bowling. Yeah. We'll take you lawn bowling so you can see what that's like. <laughs> So now there are the newer guidelines um, are the ones on the bottom here. And um, all of the recommendations in the uh, AHA, American Heart Association, and, and ACC are level of evidence C. So they're really a expert consensus um, in the absence of any kind of randomized controlled trials. 30% um, are class two where participation in sports either reasonable or can be considered. So it's changed from zero to now 30%. Um, and um, that's because either the adverse effects are, are, aren't, aren't common uh, or now there's management that can be specific that can actually allow athletes to return to play. Um, and this is sort of the, 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 the algorithm that uh, Dr. Bagish puts in this article, which is really important as it relates to talking with patients, going through and risk stratifying and kind of going through all those necessary steps. It takes a lot of work. Um, and there's been a lot of work, I think, in the, in the, sp in the realm of cardiology for a lot of different spe you know, specific conditions, right? Especially some of the genetic heart conditions and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, as well as the role of defibrillators. And is it safe to have an athlete play with a defibrillator? Um, we know now more than we did certainly back in 2005. Um, so uh, I think it's also important to consider the denominator, right? Like, when you think about all the athletes that have these conditions that have been participating and they've never had any issues whatsoever. Um, so that's important. And then there, there are still a lot of significant knowledge gaps. Uh, this was an article that Dr. Dresner, um, and, and he sort of did the same thing in terms of looking at a spectrum of return to play for athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and his point is really, there's still going to be a line in the sand, but maybe it's moving. Maybe you can move it and be a little bit more flexible uh, in certain situations when you risk stratify the athlete that's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, by age, by wall thickness, um, by whether they've had any kind of arrhythmias, et cetera. So there's a way to look at a, a particular athlete and then risk stratify, and that pro provides you with very athlete-specific information that you can then um, have a decision with, with the, the athlete and their family. Princeton scores a touchdown, they win. A field goal, we go to a third overtime. They get stopped, Lafayette wins. Robert's got the carry against, looking to slip his way through. And a hard hit. He took a shot. Jordan Colbert will break three and five. Touchdown! Touchdown! Jordan Colbert snaps through the pile. Number one, Cornell Princeton, Jordan Colbert. Outside, nice blocks, nice moves. Wow, he's quick, isn't he? He had something inside of him that didn't allow him to be tackled. Suddenly they're faced with a very serious disease that can kill them. I wouldn't be playing at all and my career is over doing all this testing and it's something with the blood. There's no cure. There's just no cure. So I'm going to move on just for the sake of time, but this is an athlete who uh, 
was a walk-on. So he came to the university, did not have a scholarship. And, and then by the time he was a senior, he was a captain. Uh, he was working in New York and uh, for like an investment banking. And he was getting up at four in the morning to do his workouts because he's a captain um, in the summertime with, with work. Um, and then um, basically came into camp in the, in the fall. And uh, I saw him for a hamstring injury. And he was a kid that would walk into the room and light, light up. The, he had this huge smile that would light up the, light up the room. And he, and he came in, and he wasn't smiling. And I'm like, hey, Jordan, are you all right? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, so, you know, I, I called the athletic trainer, and I said, Charlie, I don't know what's up, but something's wrong with, something's not right with Jordan. Two weeks later, we end up um, playing, a, playing in a match, um, and he sprains his ankle. And it's bad enough that he can't continue. So at, at halftime, He's pulled, uh, and at halftime, I, I talked to him a little bit, and I said, you know, Jordan, what is going on? And he's like, well, I'm, I've been tired. Um, I'm a bit dizzy. Um, I'm, I, I get tired going up a flight of steps, um, brush my teeth, and my, my, my gums are bleeding. Um, so I said, well, we'll get blood work, you know, two days. We'll get blood work. And I thought it was probably the anti-inflammatories that I put him on that <laughs> made him anemic or something like that. Um, but he ended up having panic values, whereas his uh, hemoglobin was um, eight, his platelet count was 15,000, and his white blood cell count was less than 0.8. Um, and so they were panic values. Um, I ended up calling him into my office and I said, I think, you know, I want you to get a teammate to drive you up to the hospital and you're gonna go to the, the, the clinic there and be admitted. Um, and they were confirmed. He ended up having a bone marrow biopsy. He had aplastic anemia, so his bone marrow was just empty. There, was no, there were no cells there. Uh, and the underlying etiology was uh, something that I'd only learned about in med school and never <laughs> remembered, uh, but parax paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which can cause aplastic anemia. Um, he was treated with blood and platelet transfusions. He was stabilized. He went back to Virginia, where he's from. He was en enrolled in a clinical trial uh, that the uh, National Institute of Health had. Um, and he start was started on a medication that's called Solaris, uh, which is an IV infusion. Um, and he was getting that every two weeks. Um, he, uh, at six months, um, responded to this treatment. And he was actually cleared. He was back home but he was cleared to return to light activity. And not very, not very long afterwards, he started saying, hey doc, am I gonna, can, I, can I come play, can I come back and play football? And you know, I'm certainly not the expert there, right? So I start having con conversations with his hematologist and our hematologist oncologist and said, you know, is this even a, can we even think about letting this guy come back and playing football and what would be the level well, how high, how high does this hematocrit have to be before he can play? How high does his white, you know, white count need to be? And he was continuing to get uh, the, the Solaris infusion, and he ended up getting it in our health center. Um, and we have a clinic, and it's like, I think $12,000 for an infusion. Um, and so it was a big decision in terms of whether we're really going to be able to, to do this. Um, and so, uh, but we did, we documented the, the risk. We had the discussion with him that he was gonna have to have weekly blood tests and that he was gonna have to um, really, you know, be, be on top of any symptoms that he might develop and, and really have a responsibility to report any symptoms. Uh, and he returned to play his uh, senior, senior season, which was, which was pretty cool. Uh, this one, I won't play the video, but uh, another American football player was seen on the sideline for a headache. The way that my, my clinic at Princeton would work is I'd see patients and then I would go out onto the, onto the American football field and finish up with, with practice because there'd inevitably be two, three, four, four guys that they would ask me to see. Um, so I'd, I ended up going out to clinic or out of clinic early that day and was, was early part of practice. And one of the players uh, said, hey, doc, you gotta check out Kamal. So he, Kamal, it was early in practice and he sat down on the, the back of our little truck and um, I said, what's going on? He's like, I, I just got a headache. So I started going through our, you know, our SCAT, right? The Maddox questions, you know, do you know where you are? 
who we play last week, uh, did we win, you know, and uh, he, he wasn't getting, they were, they were all wrong. You know, they, he was, we're in the wrong month. And I'm like, okay, so I start going through the rest of my exam and he stands up and he goes, I need air. I'm like, okay. So uh, I just sort of said, all right, I, we're, we're gonna go now. I'm, like, I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna go to the hospital. So uh, we call public safety um, and then we bring him off the field and we're waiting for public safety and he says, I don't feel good. And he started vomiting. And I said, forget public safety, call, it, call an ambulance. Uh, ambulance gets there and um, he's a little bit lethargic and I said you know I don't think I'm gonna have you go to the hospital hospital I think I want you to go to the trauma center so like five minutes further but they have a uh, you know there's someone there's someone there there's a there's a neurosurgeon there and um, he ended up having a uh, an AVM that bled and um, ended up having a emergency surgery to drain to drain the blood uh, and it was probably, you know, it was an AVM, so it was, it was something that could have just happened when he was sleeping or walking around campus, and just serendipitously it happened at practice. Um, so that was his story, and they ended up, um, the surgeon ended up deciding that um, the best option for this, based on where this was, was to have a craniotomy and um, remove the AVM, and so surgically resect it. Um, and he left school, went back uh, home to Atlanta, um, and then followed up with us. And pretty quickly, I mean, he, from, the, from the moment he was in the hospital, he said, I'm playing football again. And I'm like, uh, we're not talking about that anytime soon. Um, but literally, uh, he wanted to return to play football. Um, he had a repeat um, MR angiogram a year later that was completely normal. Um, there was no evidence for an AVM, and he was seen by the surgeon that operated on him at Princeton. He was seen by uh, the co-chair of the National Football League's Head, Neck, and Spine Committee, who is a vascular specialist. And they both agreed that since the problem had been corrected and he'd been out a year and his craniotomy had healed, that he could return to play football. Um, and so, um, again, he, we had a meeting with the athlete, with the parents, with the surgeon. Uh, in terms of what, what, the, what he had gone through and what, what the risks were. So I haven't always said yes. I already gave you the case scenario of that, the athlete that had a subdural. Um, you know, we did not feel comfortable allowing him back. Um, we basically said that, the, you know, having six days of memory loss after a very subtle uh, blow um, was not consistent with us feeling comfortable for him. Um, I've also had an athlete that was another American football player that in, uh, in, in high school had an unexplained splenic infarct. Um, and then at the end of, we, we, we cleared him after reviewing all the records that he had, had done um, around that high school injury. Um, and then he played his freshman year for us and was a star, was the uh, all, all Ivy um, player and then was studying for exams and had a stroke. Um, so he was life flighted down to uh, where, where Dr. Masters from and had treatment there, but he had um, significant persistent abnormalities and despite the fact that he wanted to come back, we didn't let him. And then we've had another, I've had another athlete with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I have to admit, like uh, when I, throughout my, my career, I've always been, you know, do they have a condition, very binary in, the, in my thinking. If they have it, okay, they're done. You know, if it's cardio, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they're done. Um, and uh, I think that it's interesting when you think, start to think about making binary decisions, whether that's the way to go. You know, binary decisions really probably aren't for humans. Um, and I think it's important to try to look at, this is actually an article that has nothing to do with medicine. Um, and, but it's a way of looking at problems and trying to uh, really deconstruct them and think differently about, about problems as you, as you come up with them. Um, return to play has been something that's been discussed at, you know, for a lot of different, you know, diff different situations. Um, who makes the call, uh, you know, shared decision making, I think is, is, is a area that we're just starting to um, see the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what about coaches and the communication as it relates to that? 
um, and um, how does that how, how does that re relate to the uh, athlete's ability to return to play as well? So there's a lot of different work that's been written about return to play, and um, you know, I think for, for me, I, it's a, a lot of uh, stakeholders and, and it's really a collaborative team. Uh, and there are some that don't feel like there are areas here that a doctor should be involved in, right? There's, you know, I've been talking with, with Mark related to some of the issues that come up for us in, in football in the United States is we have strength and conditioning folks and performance people that feel like, you know, well, do doctors don't care about performance. They don't, they're just taking care of injuries. They're just taking care of illness. It's like, no, there's a lot, of, a lot of the docs that really do think that, you know, load and being able to be preventive, you know, pre preventing in injuries and illnesses is, is really an, an important piece. So I think, uh, I think it's important that we can really work in terms of collaborating. And uh, again, for uh, athlete-centered care, when we're making these decisions, it's presenting the science and what we know as well as what we don't know. A lot of times we're good at telling a patient what we think, but not necessarily what, what really is the evidence that we have. Um, summarize their, their risk profile, discuss the options, and then take into account what their preferences might be. Um, and um, I think it's also important to really start thinking about those questions. You know, like what is the risk for someone that's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you know, does it differ if they're 14 versus, th versus, versus in their 30s? What about, you know, rupture of the spleen and, and infectious mononucleosis? How, how common does that happen? When I was first, you know, in my training, I remember being told that if someone, if you have an athlete that has a single kidney, they shouldn't play contact sports. They shouldn't play American football or, or rugby, right? But what's the real risk of uh, having an injury in rugby where you're going to lose your kidney? Right? So you sort of have to think critically, critically of this. And uh, this is an old, old video, but you see non-contact collapse, right? It wasn't like there was no mechanism of, of injury. It's not a concussion. And look at his feet. Everyone just see everyone see his feet jump. So this is a player that's got a defibrillator. It works. <laughs> so, you know, and I think we know that exercise is good, right? There's so many situations, concussion, cardiovascular risk, mental health. We know that exercise is good. And so, again, there are situations where we can, we can make a difference. So um, it's really important that we, um, have, have, that we collaborate. Um, a lot of times we have debates and people feel differently, very strongly. Uh, but it's important that we really are able to um, look at the data and, and consider what, what really is important um, and try to get rid of the politics. Uh, in the United States, we, we have these things called spaghetti westerns, right? You know, so you've heard of those. And it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, you know, you have a clinical question, when can an athlete return to play? Um, you know, the good is leadership, collaboration, and connections. The bad is faulty science, misinformation and a lack of evidence, and the ugly is, is politics or confirmation bias. Uh, I'm, I'm from outside of Boston, so we say PISA instead of good, and we say wicked ugly. Uh, so, but um, you know, I think that the, there's a lot to be said for um, really trying to lead with um, collaboration. So um, some takeaways, the return to play decision and, and, and the process is complicated. I think it's important to listen and hear other perspectives. Um, collaborate. Everyone's trying to do their job with the shared goal of athlete health and safety. Um, and figure out what the common goals are, what the big picture is, what's, what's your end game, um, and again, what are the, know the knowledge gaps, and uh, most importantly, look for options that might be able to modify risk and find a way to say yes, but only if that's what your patient wants and only if it's safe. So with that, I'll end. Awesome. Thanks, Margot. You're welcome. So we might we have some questions, but we might keep them all at the end. Is that all yeah. good? So who's up next? Your closest, Tina. Maybe maybe it's going to be you. I think so. Um, our next talk is from Dr. Christina Master. <clears throat> Dr. Master is the professor of clinical pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine and associate program director 
of the Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship. Yeah. You can speed it sure. up. It's really quick. You can make it short. Oh, you know, short, 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 Margaret short, short. had her turn. <laughs> um, board certified in pediatric sports medicine and brain injury, and she treats over 100, 800 kids each year with concussion. So this is a very concussion-centered talk. So that's the sped up version. That's perfect. Um, and I'm just going to find your talk here. Thank you. Sure I'm sure I can't find it. Um, this one? Axis Sports Auckland? Yes. That's you, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. us. That's a, yeah. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today, um, and it's such an honor um, to meet with you all. And I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about what um, the children in the Philadelphia area are teaching us about concussion. And so um, I don't have any disclosures. I aspire to have some disclosures. Um, but hopefully what we'll tell you a little bit about today is um, what we're learning about concussions from our kids in the Philadelphia area. Um, we are always trying to figure out how we can do better in terms of diagnosing and managing um, and getting our kids back to play. Um, and how are we doing that now? How have we changed over the years? And what um, is new uh, coming down the pike with some of the research that we're doing? So hopefully we'll cover a little bit of that. Um, our outreach team is really excited that I'm here, and so they wanted to make sure that um, I share uh, greetings from um, Philadelphia, and they said that they were going to tweet this this week somehow, so we'll see if you guys see that on there. Uh, but as Mark said, we do see a lot of concussions in our uh, program at um, our hospital. It is an entire network across three states. Um, we have uh, basically everything from the emergency room to primary care doctors to sports medicine specialists. I'm in the sports medicine group, which is under the pediatric orthopedic um, department. Um, but you can see we get kids that come through everywhere, ER, primary care, and sports. Um, and we have tried to do a lot to um, actually train our ER and primary care doctors um, using our electronic medical record to give them clinical decision support because we know they see a lot of things. And so um, we've uh, basically tried to develop a lot of the uh, tools that we have here, translate them into something that would be feasible and usable for them in that setting as well. Um, and then we also extend then to our PT, OT, and speech therapists as well. So we're really, really fortunate to have um, a lot of and take care of um, across the network that way. And so our question is, where are we with the diagnosis of concussion? And as you all know, I'm preaching the choir here. We're still really at subjective symptoms by and large for the most part, right? And so uh, from that perspective, what can we um, learn and understand in terms of symptoms in kids? You all know the standard you know, concussion symptom scales. There's a whole variety of them out there. Um, the PCSS or the PCSI, we use the PCSI, which is the post-concussion symptom inventory because it does have a validated tool for five to 12 year olds. And we do see kids that young in our practice with concussion. But as you can see with this, you know, it could be a concussion, but it could be a whole host of other things, right? Are they pulling an all-nighter in college? Do they have mononucleosis? Do they break up with their girlfriend? You know, do they have a migraine? You know, and the last few years could have been COVID. Absolutely, it could have been COVID. Um, or was it just a teenager? And so for any of you who have teenagers at home or work with them in the office, you know that this is really true, right? And so um, our colleague Grant Averson in Maine uh, looked at 30,000 kids and found that up to a third of boys and girls actually qualified as having post-concussion syndrome and they never had a concussion, right? So can we do a little bit better, um, you know, from that standpoint? And so what if we ask a little bit more specifically about symptoms, right? So, you know, obviously asking that symptom scale that we had up on the slide before is helpful, but what about if we ask about vision? And you'll see, you'll realize that, you know, um, our group and I are kind of a little bit obsessed with eyes and you all may think, okay, she's a little weird, but that's okay. But we're really, really interested in sort of the vision deficits you have after concussion. And so we actually um, collaborate with optometrists and they've done a bunch of studies where they looked at convergence insufficiency, which is the difficulty focusing near and basically use this symptom scale that is really visually oriented. So it asks you questions like, um, do the words jump on the page? Do you skip lines when you read? Um, do you get tired when you read? Those kinds of visually specific symptoms. And so what we found with that was that kids who had a vision diagnosis associated with a concussion actually had more of these vision specific symptoms. But interestingly enough, if they did the concussion questionnaire at the same time, like it was the same you know, visit, um, they actually didn't recognize that they had vision symptoms, right? So they had these vision symptoms, if you ask them specifically about vision symptoms, they had these vision diagnoses, but they didn't actually recognize that they had it because only 29% of them endorsed having you know, vision problem on the PCSS. So again, we can do a little bit better in terms of how we ask the question. And so then, can we do something more than just symptoms? I mean, you know, we're all clinicians and we'd like to think that we have more tools in our toolbox and we would like to think that we could actually use our clinical exam to try and figure some of these things out. And so we became really interested in what can we figure out, that we don't want to have the conversation always be, I think you have a concussion, but 
your exam looks normal. Um, and so that has happened, you know, for time immemorial, but hopefully not so much anymore. I'm sure none of you are. But we've been t tinkering with this exam here, which will may maybe look a little bit familiar to all of you um, as uh, not being that dissimilar from the vestibular ocular motor screen, which um, um, Ann Mucha and the Pittsburgh group published on. We've been tinkering it um, with it on the other side of the state. So Pittsburgh is you know, about six hours due west of Philadelphia. And so we've been tinkering with it in our um, office practice in terms of trying to figure out what's useful for us, what do we add, what do we change, and what seems to work for kids. And so. Um, we have a bunch of references there that um, certainly I'm happy also to share besides what's on the slides, um, that we have added convergence using a very specific convergence rule, which you can see there. And I actually brought one and it's in my bag back there if you want to take a look at it. And it has a specific visual target that uh, kids will tell us when it goes blurry and goes double. And then we also look at monocular accommodation where it goes blurry. And those are the cutoffs that we use based on basically um, population-based norms that our optometrists have done studies on, so that convergence greater than six is um, uh, abnormal, and then the accommodation is age-related. So my accommodation, definitely worse than your accommodation. Right? And so um, that's what we look for in the kids. Um, with regard to the vestibulocular movements that we're looking at, um, smooth pursuit is something that we take a peek at. Um, with saccades, we found that actually doing 20 repetitions was um, uh, maximizing our sensitivity and specificity. That if we asked them to be able to do 30, you know, some kids actually had some false positive. But the VOMS only has 10, and that definitely has a little bit of a ceiling effect. And a lot of kids who have concussions can do 10. And so we found that 20 worked best for us for both the saccades and the um, angular VOR. With regard to vestibular balance, um, my colleague actually, Matt Grady, developed this great um, uh, task, which we really love because it's practical. We use it in the office. It's really quick to do. It's free. And we basically call it the complex tandem gate. But essentially, it's five steps and four conditions. Eyes open forwards, eyes closed forwards, eyes open backwards, eyes closed backwards. And so there's a link to the video um, there that you can see on our website. But just so you can see here, just some examples. Um, we'll have them sort of all run together here. Uh, smooth pursuit, um, some uh, VOR, and then that gal. These the two kids on the left are all normal, um, and in Sakad's VOR, smooth pursuit, complex tandem gait. In terms of what we see then in the office for a kid who's like injured, um, this is a kid who has concussion and he's doing eyes opens forwards right now, then he's gonna do eyes closed. What's nice about the four conditions is that each condition is a little bit harder. It actually helps you with the ceiling effect um, so that you know um, almost everybody can do it eyes open forward. But the eyes closed backwards gets really hard and actually sometimes we'll have parents you know, at this stage say, Johnny, cut it out, we're at the doctor's office, stop horsing around because they can't believe their child's balance is that off after a concussion, right? And if you don't do this, you don't know. And so we found it very, very useful. It takes, as you can see, total tops, two, three minutes to do this entire evaluation. And it's um, really handy to us in the office. So what do we find when we look for these deficits? And so in this study, we looked at 100 kids and we found that actually um, there was a high rate of um, uh, visual disturbances. And so saccadic dysfunction at 29%, accommodation deficits at 51%, and convergence insufficiency at 49%. Interestingly, you can also see that a lot of these kids had two or three of these, you know, um, different um, deficits. And so from that perspective, it really does speak to the fact that what's going on in the brain is that um, it's the higher level function that's being affected in terms of integrating visual input and visual function. Um, and so that's, um, it makes sense to clinicians who are seeing this, you know, um, in the office on the sidelines. This is a guy who came to us in the summer um, after a uh, American football practice, and he's trying to do vertical saccades here, and he's really just having a hard time um, coordinating. This is a guy, a young guy, who saw three or four other clinicians before us and was always told that his vision was normal, even though he was complaining of vision problems. And part of the problem was because all we really do for screening is visual acuity, right? And so it, it's not common um, in a lot of general you know, medicine to check for eye movements. And so that's where, again, we would say um, we want to look a little bit more closely. And why is this important? Um, in some of the work done by my junior colleague here, Dan Corwin, um, what we found was that our kids who have vestibular deficits just seem to have issues where they took longer to return to school, longer to return to sport, took longer to recover on some computerized neurocognitive testing that we would perform, um, and then also seemed to predict some persistent symptoms. And so that's, again, a little bit of the holy grail right now. You know, when you come and you present to care, 
Are you going to be one of the people that's going to get better in a few days or a few weeks? Or are you going to be someone who's going to take, you know, three weeks, four weeks, months? You know, and so um, reseated near point of convergence, um, having symptom provocation on those visio vestibular testing, dizziness, um, a premorbid um, history of anxiety, depression, and three or more concussions seem to predict um, a longer recovery. And what was interesting was that um, our kids who had three or more concussions had a higher prevalence of these deficits. So there might be a hint of a little bit of a dose effect there in terms of injury. And then we were interested in the relationship between the visual and vestibular because even though they're different um, systems, they are related. And in this study, what we looked at was that these signs and symptoms actually appeared to cluster, fall into two, two different clusters. Um, there was a vestibular cluster where actually it wasn't just balance that was in the vestibular cluster, but also it was uh, the VOR, um, smooth pursuit and saccades, which, you know, again, you could have thought maybe it was gonna fall into the vision cluster, but those eye movements actually fell more under the vestibular cluster. And then the vision cluster made sense that it was in your point of convergence and accommodation amplitude. But then what was interesting, if you look at this figure, which is a little bit disorienting, so I apologize, but what the yellow is is the presence of, this, um, of the um, sign or the symptom, and then the blue is the absence. If you look at the different clusters, the vestibular cluster, almost everybody has the vestibular cluster, but the yellow bar that goes all the way across are the people who have vestibular as well as vision deficits. And so it looks like the kids who have vision also have vestibular, um, and that, that's a subset of the kids who have vestibular issues. And so, again, kind of makes sense for all of you taking care of kids out there, they have kind of both and, not either or. Um, and so I think that that's one thing that's interesting to us. And then in this study, what we found was that um, the smooth pursuit uh, VOR and balanced deficit predicted um, uh, prolonged recovery beyond a month. And then the abnormal accommodation also did, um, but the near point of convergence didn't. And so along those lines, again, some things maybe to look for that might be helpful in terms of predicting who's gonna take longer to recover. So what? Why do we care about this? She's interested in eyes, I'm interested in eyes, you're not interested in eyes, why do you care? Um, I think it really does help us with our patients and our athletes in terms of helping them understand what can be a very bewildering in Ill injury. It's probably something that's not like anything they've had before, and so how do we help them um, feel like they have some self-efficacy, some agency, and not just having this really strange injury you know, act on them? And so hopefully um, by doing this assessment, it actually gives us a little bit of insight into what they're experiencing and how can we help them in terms of managing that. And so from that standpoint, we want them to be able to understand how to manage getting back to school, getting back to activities and not sitting in a dark room forever and ever. You can't, you know, um, your brain is a use it or lose it kind of organ, just like a muscle, even though it's not a muscle. And so the implications are in smooth pursuit, you know, they're gonna have trouble with a moving target. And so that could be an issue for ball sports but also an issue for driving, right? And so we're doing some research in that area as well because that's actually pretty um, uh, dangerous um, as, as far as activities go that teenagers do. And then saccades, you know, are jumping activities that are used in scanning. And so kids who have trouble with saccades on your exam are gonna have trouble with reading if it's horizontal. If it's vertical, it's going to be taking notes, right? Looking at the monitor, looking back at the um, keyboard or notebook. Um, so giving them the, some insight into that is sometimes helpful. The near point of convergence obviously is going to be really hard if you're going to be reading it near, um, at a near distance. And so that could be, you know, a book or a tablet or a phone. Um, there's a contribution from monocular accommodation. Um, and so kids who have um, near point of convergence and accommodation issues can have blurry vision, loss of place, words moving on the page. Um, what's interesting about accommodation, obviously, is that besides contributing to convergence, um, it's under autonomic control, right? And so then that gives you a little hint as to maybe what can we do to treat that? And so we'll get to that in just a second as well, because you know we're always trying to uh, make some connections in terms of what we're doing. And so some of the relevant accommodations we'll give our kids with regard to school, um, in particular with a visual, that they get extra time or untimed tasks, you know, um, pacing breaks that are particularly visual pacing breaks. We'll talk about physical breaks and cognitive breaks, um, but in particular we'll talk to our kids about visual breaks as well. Um, Pre-printed notes, large font, um, electronic, um, printed versus electronic format or audio format. And then again, the extra time in the hallways is sometimes helpful for all the um, VOR issues. And so then in the United States, we've been, um, our pediatric um, organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, has been interested in trying to make sure that pediatricians are the most common place where kids are seen first after an injury. Um, and we want them to be aware that they should be looking out for this. Um, and again, how can they try and think about asking the right questions, maybe doing um, some kind of a screening examination, and then um, either giving supportive care or then referring on to a specialist as needed. 
And then what do we do, you know, from a concussion standpoint? Um, you'll recognize this from the um, consensus statement from Berlin, which is um, the update is delayed, and Margot's um, been a huge part of actually getting the next version out from Amsterdam, and that's been a huge amount of work. So hopefully there'll be an update next spring. Um, but right now, we're not doing a whole lot early on, but there are some things that we have learned since 2017 that I think are really worth pointing out. And so first um, article that I want to highlight here is from our colleagues in the emergency department in the University of Wisconsin. So Danny Thomas and the ER there basically randomized uh, kids either to a couple of days of rest or five days of rest. And then they just looked at what they, how they did. Um, and what they found was that the kids who rested a little bit longer actually had a longer outcome. They took longer to recover. So it is possible to have too much of a, bad, of a good thing, right? And so I think from that standpoint, more is not always better. Um, and so one to two is sort of where I think lots of folks have landed in, in terms of a little bit of time where you have a break, you modify your activities, let your symptoms um, abate a bit, and then start ramping back up gradually. And then more recently, um, just last year, Mac now and Rebecca Mannix at Children's Hospital of Boston, so our colleagues up north, um, did a randomized controlled trial looking at um, screen time, and they randomized kids to screen time permitted or screen time abstained. You can see that they didn't really abstain, so basically the abstinence group had 130 minutes of uh, um, you know, screen time, uh, even with a recommendation to you know, re refrain. Uh, but compared to their like, let them loose group, where they did 620 minutes of screen time, there was a difference there in terms of the kids who were meant told to restrict. And the screen time permitted group did take longer to recover. So they took eight days versus three and a half days. So again, probably about as good evidence as we're gonna get that having a little bit of a break from the electronics is not a terrible thing those first couple of days. So you have a little bit of a foot to stand on when you're recommending that and not just being like a mean, you know, boomer or Gen X, you know, like in terms of what you're telling your kids out there, right? And so, so um, that's helpful. The other thing that we were really, um, excited about then too is that there's active rehabilitation strategies for persistent symptoms where essentially vestibular um, therapy which uh, many of you are going to be um, much more expert than I am um, in is something that we'll do um, with kids if they have uh, persisting symptoms and the question really is how early can we do it and so um, we're still working on uh, the answer to that as our other uh, folks in the group um, around the world. Um, with regard to exercise and aerobic exercise, that um, was an open question. What's the timing of that? And, and we were um, really fortunate to be in a study where um, essentially what we found was that if um, you prescribed a heart rate targeted aerobic exercise prescription, which you know, we always had to make very clear to our kids, this is not training, um, this is not sports training, um, this is a little bit of aerobic activity, right? And so that's really important because if you, again, tell athletes, oh, you can exercise, they're gonna like let her rip and then go on out there and exercise. And that probably isn't what um, is indicated in this early time frame. Um, but in the study that was led by John Letty at Buffalo, also with um, uh, Bill Meehan and Recomatics in Boston and our group at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we found that kids were able to get an exercise prescription that was heart rate targeted, where they were allowed to have their symptoms go up by one or two points on the 10 point pain scale, um, but then stop. Um, and if they did that every day for half an hour, um, starting in that first week, um, they actually um, recovered quicker uh, than the kids who um, did not exercise. And they also had a lower likelihood of having persistent symptoms um, and not having problems um, a month out. In terms of cognitive issues, you know, we don't commonly refer our kids to either speech therapy or occupational therapy. Um, what we find is that if we can work with our schools and have them approach school as if it were achieving recovery goals and not academic goals, that actually makes a huge difference because, again, um, then they get two birds with one stone where they're doing schoolwork as well as recovery, but they don't feel that academic pressure to achieve because they can't because they don't have the cognitive stamina to be able to do so. And so that's usually how we approach the cognitive. Um, and a few kids will do the formal speech and OT with executive function training. And then the vision um, rehab we'll, we'll use to address the specific visual symptoms and increase visual stamina. And so in this study, we looked at vestibular therapy, and what we found was that with these kids, actually, um, they're a more chronic cohort, as you can see. They were a month or more out from their um, injury, um, and then they started the PT later. But um, the vestibular physical therapy actually helped um, ameliorate their symptomatic issues with the visio vestibular exam. In particular, um, were helpful with both general concussion symptoms, visio vestibular symptoms, as well as the balance on the best um, evaluation, which you guys all know but it didn't address the near point of convergence problems. And so again, a little hint that these symptoms are related, but different. 
And so then in this study um, that we looked at, um, what we found was that of the kids who had this receded near point of convergence in terms of a, a seeming to manifest a real visual deficit, um, that some of those kids actually did get better on their own um, in that um, four week time frame. Um, Another 41% resolved their near point of convergence issues with vestibular therapy, where there is a little bit of you know, eye training that's done. But then there was that smaller 13% that really need to go on and have vision rehab to have that um, be addressed. And so again, now we're starting to break down what are the types of kids potentially that may need different, slightly different approaches in terms of how we um, treat and manage them. And so then this is the slide with the aerobic exercise preventing persistent symptoms. And so, again, we're interested in the fact that this um, uh, aerobic exercise, we think, is targeting the autonomic nervous system, um, that that um, system is dysregulated after concussion. And if it doesn't recover on its own, might benefit from um, aerobic exercise as a therapy. Um, and then we are interested in potentially um, the eyes being a window into that, right, because of the pupillary light reflex um, and monocular um, accommodation um, is related to the accommodative um, amplitude and your autonomic function, um, aerobic exercise might be a treatment for accommodative deficits, right? And so there's a little crosstalk there in your brain. And so then this is our guy, again, that you saw before um, his vestibular therapy. And then after his vestibular therapy, his balance is a lot better on our complex tandem gait. And so basically you see um, what we like about um, removing the visual um, compensation is the fact that basically when you have the visual input, you're able to compensate more for balance issues. When you remove that visual input, you're probably getting a little bit better sense of what your brain balance is like and not just your integrated you know, musculoskeletal and brain balance. And then this is our guy with the funky eye movements before his vision rehab. And then this is him after his vision rehab. And so again, I think that I don't know why it took us so long, maybe, maybe it's just us, you may have landed on this earlier, but obviously there are systems in the brain that we can rehabilitate. And so even though concussion is the mildest form of mild traumatic brain injury, there may be um, approaches that we can try and use for our kids. The last little bit that I wanna share with you is that we're doing some interesting stuff looking into physiological biomarkers um, in concussion. And this is functional near infrared spectroscopy, which is essentially like a poor man's um, MRI. It gives you um, an idea of what the blood flow is um, in the brain given any particular activity the brain is doing. In this study, we had them um, essentially read the King Devic test where it's a rapid number naming test. They read it as quickly as they can. We can get even little kids as young as you know, seven or eight to do this wearing that optode. Our engineers on our team uh, basically developed this calculation of neural efficiency where essentially neural efficiency, the concept is that it's whatever your performance output is minus your efficiency plus the little you know, conversion of the square root of two. But the neural efficiency is on that diagonal where essentially you know, your performance is equal your effort. Like whatever your effort you're putting in, you're getting the exact same of performance out. And so that's a neural efficiency of zero. If you're more efficient, you're on the upper left quadrant. If you're less efficient, you're in the lower right quadrant. And what we found in our concussed kids was that basically our concussed kids were less efficient than their non-concussed adolescent counterparts. And so what we really liked about the study was that it basically validated that everything our kids have been telling us all along, that after a concussion, they can do the things that they used to do, they just can't do it quite as quickly or as efficiently and as well. And so um, we were really thrilled to be able to um, back up what they're telling us you know, with some um, research and some science. So take home is that these vision and vestibular deficits are really common, please look for them. Um, and you can actually target some of your um, uh, support and accommodations for academics and for activities and sports you know, accordingly. Um, active recovery is really where we wanna go now, not passive um, uh, wait and see. Um, targeted rehab um, uh, strategies I think are really useful. And then keep an eye on potentially some new developments with some physiological markers that will be hopefully coming down the pike that will be helpful down the line. And so we have lots of resources on our website. Um, and so please um, take a look. Um, we also have a quarterly newsletter that um, I can also um, send a link for if you would like to sign up and hear more. This is my awesome team. I don't do it all by myself. Um, and this is us at a Phillies game where it was earlier this year and we actually won that one, not like the one that we lost um, in the World Series last couple weeks ago. Um, and that's my email. Um, and please reach out with any questions um, anytime. Thanks. Um, so, uh, well, maybe our last speaker, it depends on how keen we are, is uh, Dr. Siobhan Statuta. Siobhan, I'm going to call you Siobhan, is that yeah, okay? We don't really call people doctors here, um, not even, yeah, anyway, that's a bad joke, I'll keep it to myself. 
So Siobhan is a sports medicine primary care specialist and has been part of the University of Virginia School of Medicine since 2007. She created a practice which focuses mainly on sports medicine, which is split between looking after Division I collegiate athletes as one of two teams of uh, physicians and looking after athletes from the community in a running clinic. Um, she also works as one of the team physicians for the US under 20 soccer women's national team. And her professional interests specifically include the care of runners, women, and mental health considerations in sport. So over to you, sure. Oh, actually, let me, yeah, yeah. I can do this. I can, oh yeah, clap. I can't give this Everyone should clap. <laughs> yeah. This one? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Cool. All right. Hi everyone. Um, please, if you do want to stand up for a second, you can. If not, I'm going to get going. My name is Siobhan. I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about an, the IOC Sport Mental Health Assessment Tool. Um, but before we get into this, I do want to thank AMSSM um, for sending us overseas. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, despite his highest efforts to get us to dress in white for the cricket, uh, we, he has been <laughs> phenomenal um, as a host. So thank you, Mark. Um, thank you to Axis for having us here tonight. And then I'd also like to thank my two fellows that I've been traveling with. It's been wonderful so far and can't wait for the remainder of the, of the adventures coming up. So um, I do have nothing to disclose, but I will say up front that I'm a huge fan of this course. It's called the IOC Diploma in Mental Health in Elite Sport course. I drank the Kool-Aid about a couple of years ago when I heard Ma Margo Mountjoy give a talk about how we were dealing with this problem of mental health problem, uh, mental health disorders and symptoms, and we weren't being able to address it. Uh, this was back in about 2016, 2017. So I went ahead, I signed up for this course, which is worldwide, and I was able to do it virtually. And then you complete the course with a diploma, which looks great on your wall, but as a GP in America, I felt like I was a very naturally, my personality led to being decent at mental health assessment of patients. But it took my level from here all the way up to here. So again, if you guys have the interest, um, it is something that you will use in your practice and I hope you'll use it more so after tonight's talk. All right, so there it is and there'll be more to come. Now. I don't know if you guys heard Margo. Margo was talking about how they say things in Boston. For those of you guys who have been to Boston, they have this awesome, awful accent. And so people in Boston say wicked smat. Um, we're not going to be talking about wicked smat people today. We're going to be talking about the smat. So the letters are rearranged a little bit. It's the S-M-H-A-T, not smat. Um, all right. So today, here's going to be our sprint. We're going to have four stops and possibly a fifth. Um, what are we talking about? How did it come about? What does it entail and is it feasible? Now I know I'm talking to an audience of doctors and physios um, and so I'm gonna be hopefully making it um, a little bit more applicable. But I always believe that in order to understand something you have to understand the history behind it. So we need to talk about two major things. What is mental health? And you have a lot of words over in the far left hand corner. I'm gonna read it for you. This is mental health. Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can, hope, can cope with the normal stressors of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. All right, so that's mental health. That's when things are going really well. But when things start to decline a little bit, you begin to develop mental health symptoms and disorders. So as defined by the American Psychiatric Association in 2013, this, is, this implies significant changes in thinking, emotion, and or behavior that occurs over time, resulting in distress and or problems functioning in social work or family activities. Very different. So we deal with a very athletic population in general, people who, who like sport. So we're really good at fixing the physical. We're really good at addressing the knee and the shoulder. But that's only the physical component of health. That's only part of it. We need to address the mental component too. An athlete who is, who is healthy mentally and physically, they're great. A patient, an athlete who is physically well and mentally not well is not great. Think of it as the flip, somebody who's mentally well but physically not there's work to do, so we need to become better versed. 
So mental health in athletes though, elite athletes, there's now you're at putting them into a pressure cooker. There's even more contributing to the stressors that they're being berated with. So things such as playing time or poor athletic performance or even exposure to harassment, which we're hearing more and more about. All right, so what happens when this beautiful mental health begins to disintegrate. And if we take a closer look, you can see that it, this is a huge spectrum of things that can be contributing. You've got things such as ADHD, overtraining, personality issues, a lot of chemical imbalances. Um, and so this is where we need a better method to screen to help our athletes. We're, we're getting good at coming up with the Lockman exam for the ACL, but we need methods to start looking a little bit more at mental health. We want something ideally to be standardized that you guys can use here and we can use in North America. Um, we want to be able to identify when somebody's beginning to slip early so that we can intervene and get them back. The longer somebody goes on, it's gonna be delving into a rabbit hole and so we wanna be able to correct that sooner. We want something too that we can look and be like, ah, oh, there's a problem and I can come in right here and fix this. So something that is intervenable and then something that is clinically useful, something that's feasible. All right, and enter the SMAT. All right, how did it come about? Uh, the International Olympic Committee in 2017 decided we needed to address this. Margot's picture is up there. She was part of the expert panel who tasked with reviewing the scientific uh, literature on mental health symptoms and disorders. And they were asked to look at the prevalence, the diagnostics of this, as well as management, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. Additionally, they were asked to present recommendations to minimize the negative impacts of the sporting environment on these mental health symptoms and disorders. So they came out with a consensus statement. It came out in 2019. And in this paper, which is a really helpful and useful paper, uh, well worth reading for anybody who is involved in clinical care, um, within, embedded in it, they have areas identified for, for future areas of research, but one of the needs that they found was the need to appropriately screen for mental health symptoms and disorders. Out of this large group, they narrowed it down to 11 individuals who then were tasked with reviewing over 14,000 documents, interviewing previous and current elite athletes, getting their attitudes and their, their stories on mental health, and what they found from these athletes is that two thirds of them felt very uncomfortable talking to their coaches, talking within their sporting environment about any struggles that they were having. And that 90% of them supported coming up with a method to screen. So they came, the, the task, the mental health working group came up with two screening forms. And one of them is the SMAT, but there's another one called the SMERT. So what's the difference? The SMERT is the Sport Mental Health Recognition Tool, S-M-H-R-T. This is for the athlete entourage. This is for the friends of the athlete. This is for fellow athletes, families, coaches, somebody who realizes that, hey, you know what? My teammate, there's something going on. So it's a, it's a screening form that they can go through and identify, hey, there's a problem here. You need to get the help from somebody who's gonna be able to help you a little bit more. So then they get over to the sport mental health assessment tool, which should be done by medical professionals or those in the medical field. So SMERT, non-medical, SMAT, medical. Um, it's usually, uh, anybody of the medical team can, can conduct it, but if there's going to be any intervention, that has to be done by the sport medicine physician or, a, or the licensed mental health professional. All right, what does it entail? This is, it's, it's really quite easy. You can Google it, you can download it, you can print it. This is what it looks like. And what I'm gonna be specifically doing is showing you and talking through this algorithm right here. Um, essentially, it's three stages. Number one, we're gonna triage this individual. Number two, we're gonna screen, do some screening tests. And number three, we're gonna do some action, some brief or more in-depth intervention. So if at each stage everything is going really well and the athlete seems healthy and good, it's a green light, they can keep going. But if there are concerns along the way, then it's a yellow light and you're prompted to ask more questions. All right, so it's essentially a stoplight system. All right, step one, so this is the very top. So right over there, 
I've blown that up. For this, we use a test called the APSQ, the Athlete Psychological Strain Questionnaire. And this assesses sport-related psychological distress. So for example, and it tells you exactly, over the past 30 days, have you been feeling, and for those of you guys that over there, I'll read to you a couple, I was less motivated. I found training to be more stressful. So you can see there are five columns. The lowest score you can rate yourself is not, not none of the time rather, and you get one point, all the way up to all the time, which is five points. So you sum this up. So the lowest point score that you could get out of these 10 questions is 10. The highest is 50. What they found out through further, further evaluation is that the cutoff score was 17. So this was found to be a valid score separation. So anybody who scores less than 17, that's a green light and they're good. So they're under normal but lower psychological stress. However, if somebody is 17 or above, that's when there needs to be a little bit more concern. They move on to step two. So we're done with step one. Step two, screening. Screening involves six different types of tests. And it looks for anxiety, depression, eating, sleep disturbance, alcohol, and drug misuse. And then what you want to do is as this individual is taking these tests, you're keeping a running score. So the running score is on this form right here. I said six tests. There are seven columns. And I'll talk to you about that in just one second. Depression is split up into two. So the first one, anxiety. Here we use the generalized anxiety disorder seven, so, or the GAD seven, to ask about symptoms that they've had in the past two weeks. Again, if they score, under a 10, they're good. If they score over a 10, it flips them from a green zone into a yellow zone. Similarly for depression, here we use the PHQ-9, so it was a total of nine questions. Again, if somebody has a lot of symptoms, their score is gonna be higher. So if the score is over 10, it's gonna kick them into the yellow zone. Now, I don't know if any of you guys use the PHQ-9 on a regular basis in clinic, but there's a, there's a question at the bottom that should always raise concern. And that question is, do you ever want to hurt yourself? Are you thinking about hurting yourself, essentially? Or can, would you be better off dead? If you score any point at all, that aborts the test. That's a red light, you stop. All right. Um, so therefore, back on this form, you've been keeping track. You've got the, the anxiety. You've got depression. But you've also got this one question, which if they, tested, if they said that they wanted to hurt themselves, you stop the test immediately. All right, so a few more tests. We, we look for, at, for uh, sleeping disturbance, and for this we use the Athletes Sleep Screening Questionnaire, which is a series of five questions. We also ask about alcohol use, which can be pretty prominent. And here we use the Audit C, which stands for Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Consumption. We use drugs, uh, and for this we use the Cage Aid, which is cutting down. You get annoyed by criticism, you feel guilty, and you use it as an eye-opener, and this can be adapted to drugs. So a second portion of this is, have you ever used any of these substances and it's created a problem in your life over the past three months? So are you guys beginning to understand a little bit? We're, we're searching a little bit more into these, each of these silos that contribute to mental health. And then lastly, we have eating dis uh, disordered eating. Here we use the beta Q, brief eating disorder, in athletes questionnaire. All right, so now, as somebody has gone through, you're checking off their score. Okay, this per they scored a two here, they're good, they scored, oh, they scored an 11 with depression, but they don't wanna hurt themselves. But everything else is green. So what do we do with one yellow? Well, all of them have to be green in order to be good. But if somebody scores a yellow in anything, you're gonna move on to the next step, of course, if the depression question number nine was read, that's, you've already stopped the test. All right, so that's the screening portion. Lastly, we have action. Um, if the six screening tests are good, you still have them in your office. You can give them a little bit of counseling, give them something. So do a brief intervention. Um, you can talk to them about mindfulness or meditation or stress control. You can talk to them about the Calm app to help them go to sleep. Just give them a little pointer because you have them in the room. Um, if, though, somebody tests yellow for something, you want to do a clinical assessment and management. This is where you want to really dig. 
Is there a problem here? So this should be completed by a sports medicine physician or a licensed mental health professional. And it's super important to understand that if somebody scores a yellow on these tests, that does not indicate it's, a diagnost it's diagnostic. It means that it raises the concerns for this and it's worth following up with a, with a physician to determine whether they do indeed have that condition. All right, here you can identify important problems, you can intervene, you can look at previous screening tests. You can also ask at this time, are you getting harassed? What is going on with your sport? You're not the same person. You know, I, I'm concerned about you. Let's talk a little bit more. And you also want to do a comprehensive assessment because very often anxiety does not exist by itself. Anxiety is often intertwined with depression. And when somebody's anxious and depressed, they oftentimes can't eat very well or they can't sleep well. So it becomes much more complex. It's just not a clean, pretty identification. So what I also like to point out with this form is on the very back of it, there's, there's an additional battery of tests that if you are maybe not quite feeling that, that everything has been identified, there are additional tests that test for ADHD, bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder, gambling, and psychosis. And this is all in a nine page, very easy to follow document off of Google, off of the IOC website. All right. So we've gone through that. Is it feasible? I mean, it's taken me 10 minutes to explain it to you. It's a little dry, I understand. But if you walk through it with somebody, is, it, is, is that realistic in our practice? Um, well, Dr. Margot Mountjoy decided to take a closer look at this. She used it in her university setting in Ontario, Canada. There she had a cohort of 550 athletes that spread across 17 sports. Um, the screenings were done online, but this was done during COVID. So we need, to, I, we need to look at the data a little bit more clearly. Now, this is a little bit of a complex slide. You'll see over on the left, there's T0, T1, T2, time zero, time one, time two. Time zero was in October of 2020, and it was in the middle of the semester. T1 was in January. So winter break had finished. Classes had not picked up yet. And then T2 was later in the semester, kind of when they were approaching finals. We're not going to go through all of the findings, but I do want to pick out, show you a few things. Out of a total of 550, the initial response rate was phenomenal. It was 98%, 543 out of 550. That was a really good response rate. But as the year went on, or as the study went on, it dropped down to 336 and then eventually down to 133 with a major predominance towards female athletes responding at the very end. So what can, we, what can we garner from this? So taking a look at the APSQ, remember this is what looks at psychological strain. First of all, values were way higher than, than what were to be expected. And if you take a look, T0 was about mid-20s, and then it jumped up to nearly 40, and then back down into the 30s. So what happened here? I mean. What they're thinking is that first fall semester of competition, they were still practicing with their teammates. There was no competition, but they were in the university setting playing their sport with their team. Then due to COVID, they were not allowed to return to even practice together, and many of these university students were sent home. So it, it, we have to take this because it was, it was implemented at a time when COVID was really changing the world. Um, so could it have been due to the cancellation of sports? Then the GAD7, the PHQ9, um, just taking a look at those um, high numbers. But now here, T1, which is during January, the values dropped. So anxiety and depression, what could that be due to? Well, could it be the timing of the academic pressures? Because T0 and T2 were right in the middle of the semester, so they were studying for midterms and they were studying for, for finals. Additionally, rates were higher than previous years, so could it have been COVID like we just talked about? So this was the first time it was implemented. There are clearly some limitations to this. The IOC advocates for repeated use over a single sports season just to monitor that individual, and they were able to do that here. It was the first time that this tool was used in this fashion. It was used online. Uh, it provided insight into the mental health of these athletes, and it was able to be completed, so it was feasible. So now what we're hoping is that there is a tool 
that is available to the public that we can be, be begin to use and have as a resource, even just having it printed out in one's clinic. So final thoughts, we do need to go there. We need to acknowledge, we need to ask. We're often the people working with these athletes. We know them really, really well. We know when they're off. Take that extra second to ask. Familiarize yourself with the test, and there is definitely a call for um, more research. Take interest, look into it a little bit. Um, and hopefully we can begin to address you know, the, the stressors and the concerns. Um, and then this is the information uh, for the IOC Diploma course. If you are at all interested, it's very easy. If you type in IOC Diploma course mental health, it takes you straight to that page. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Maybe you guys want to come back up? Why don't you stay there, Siobhan, and we'll invite the other two guys back up. Um, I'm just wondering whether we've got any questions from the from the room. Great. Hi, I'm Becca, I'm a physio. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Firstly, around um, sort of visual training um, and concussion. And so are you utilizing neurooptometrists within that space? Yeah, we're, we work with develop, pediatric developmental optometrists. Um, so that's, uh, I think, the little wrinkle with being at a pediatric institution and working mostly with kids. Um, I do think that some of our adult colleagues might use neurooptometrists, but we use the developmental um, optometrists because of the fact that um, they had the experience with convergence insufficiency that was developmental, um, which is separate from convergence insufficiency related to either accommodative issues or um, uh, concussion. Um, and those um, approaches seemed to work. And so it was kind of like an organic, they were seeing a lot of kids with concussion and visual issues and we were seeing kids with concussion and visual issues and we sort of met in the middle and realized that we had um, some really great um, potential synergy to help the kids. So we use um, developmental optometrists. I think that they're called different things around the world. Um, so, and I think that they're also different types within that. And what can be hard is that uh, we're very lucky um, in Philadelphia with our um, Pennsylvania College of Optometry that um, you know, they're experts um, in uh, CI and have done um, NIH-funded trials that demonstrate that that vision rehab works for CI that's developmental. We're in a study right now trying to demonstrate that it works for concussion as well, concussion-related CI. What do you guys call them here? We call them behavioral optometrists. Yeah, I think so. But then they'll have different subsets within behavioral yeah. optometry. So yeah. some will be more yeah, pediatric, but more around like CP, et cetera, rather. Uh -huh. I guess, like yeah. Them. Yeah, not all places in the U.S. actually it. are fortunate enough to have yeah. folks right there, and so, and we, we oftentimes use uh, the the you know physical therapists mm -hmm. or occupational therapists that. often yeah. are trained to do that because it's a fine motor skill too. So that's the other angle. The other thing, just to be mindful about in the in New Zealand context, is that generally ACC are not interested in getting involved with behavioral optometry. So. You may think someone might benefit from it, but trying to get it funded can be very challenging. And that's the same in the U.S. actually too. And so that's why we're really trying to develop the evidence for it because we think that that's a, that is a bias um, that's negative against what they do. Um, and that I think is for lots of historical reasons that's before we all arrived on the scene. Um, but I think there is some benefit to that. And so um, exactly, we have the same issues with our insurance covering as well. Um, but it is, it is increasing and it is increasing based on the evidence that's being produced by others as well as our group. Cool. We have a question down the back. I just find from the head injury too, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm way out of my depth, but I enjoyed your presentation. Your presentation was on concussion in children. And in our society, I don't know if it's like the same in North America, there's a presumption by the general public, by parents, that a concussion's a minor injury. Um, what's the role of accordance of brain injury, giving your talk if this is a brain injury in children? Because brain injury has a much bigger impact it's, people, it's actually what it is. Concussion, I don't know what the definition in the, in the dictionary is, but certainly it confuses or makes it seem less serious. So I'm just throwing it out here yeah. uh, as the preeminent children's hospital in North America prepared to change it from concussion to brain injury to have more impact. Well, that's very kind. I don't think we're number one anymore, actually. So, um, you know, <laughs> as my CEO would tell us, you know, we're not the first children's hospital in the U.S., and she's not happy about that. But um, <laughs> I think that's a really relevant point, actually. Um, and one thing that I didn't talk about was that I was um, also really um, privileged to be a part of um, an interdisciplinary group 
from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine that was looking at traumatic brain injury across the spectrum. And that is one of the discussions that is being had right now. And, and Dr. Um, Patukian will also um, uh, uh, let you know that in the um, uh, conversation in Amsterdam, um, there was discussion on what the definition of concussion or mild traumatic brain injury is. Um, I think the problem ends up being, so there's two things. Yes, absolutely. The, the term concussion is less frightening to families. Um, you know, there's some really good research that shows that, you know, parents feel much more comfortable that it's just a concussion and not a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, it is a mild traumatic brain injury. It's probably the mildest form of um, traumatic brain injury. And the issue ends up being really not what kind of injury is it, but what kind of recovery is it going to be? Is it going to be spontaneous and short, or is it going to be longer, and what does that mean? And I think that the other problem that we have is that we don't really have great biomarkers, either you know, body fluids, blood, urine, saliva, or physiological to be able to define that. So we basically have like one big garbage can bucket. you know. And you're absolutely right. Like I, We call it a concussion, um, probably like historically from a sports standpoint, um, because um, that's what we call it. Um, but we call call the same thing a sports concussion when you get better in a few days, a few weeks, or a few months. And clearly, like, no one would say that that's the same injury, right, um, necessarily, and, and not the same entity even, because it might not be concussion entirely or concussion be part of it, but there could also be other things as well. So I think I have a really unsatisfactory answer for you, which is that you are 100% correct. We don't have really good semantics. We're working on it. Yeah, good, Stu. So again, just for a bit of New Zealand context, this is a conversation we've had at our ACC Sports Collaboration Group. And I would say within that group, there's a definite desire to call it a brain injury. But um, we have not done that yet because we're still trying to do more of an education job. And the feeling is that people understand what a concussion is. And perhaps it's easier to start talking about that and then transition to brain injury. So it's kind of a part of the sales strategy, I guess. You know, in, in the U.S., there is all, a lot of the educational, like all the posters that go up in uh, professional locker rooms all the way down to the grassroots kids', kids mm -hmm. locker rooms. Mm -hmm. It will say concussion is a brain injury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that is. And what we did talk about in, in Amsterdam was exactly, you know, do we, do we use a, a modified Berlin diagnosis, you know, which is to go to the Berlin document and then look at that definition of concussion? Um, or do we go to um, a definition that's more criteria based, plausible mechanism, symptoms, signs, which is tricky because not all athletes have signs of concussion and um, and then either laboratory or, or you know, other types of imaging findings. And the main pushback was if you don't have sim if you don't have signs, you're going to call it a suspected concussion, and then you're going to be in all kinds of trouble with uh, insurance companies because they're not going to pay for a suspected concussion treatment. They're only going to pay for it if it's a confirmed uh, diagnosis. So it's still kind of up in the air as to where it is, but um, the messaging is concussion is a brain injury. So the worst is a head knock. Yeah, exactly. uh, or a ding. It kills or me. Ding. Oh, yeah. yeah. We don't really have a ding in New Zealand. We have you know? a head knock. <laughs> head yeah. knock. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything else? From a concussion in a return to play point of view, as far as biomarkers go, is there research that's happening in the US kind of on that front? Yeah, there's a lot of work, uh, both with um, the blood biomarkers and then actually salivary biomarkers. But uh, Mike McRae, actually in Amsterdam, spoke on that. and really ended up that the take home message was it's not yet ready for prime time, you know, but hopefully soon there's a lot of there's a lot of work that we're all waiting for. Yeah. Yeah, I think actually the one thing I just read in the news recently was that the blood biomarkers, um, the two that have gotten the most interest in the U.S. are GFAP and UCHL1. Um, you know, there has been um, licensing of that so that you could actually use it in like the emergency department setting to determine whether or not you're going to use it, get a CT or not on right. that patient. I just read that there's one f hospital in Florida that just started using it. Like yeah, it's, it's been approved for years, but none of us have used it because again, um, it only it doesn't diagnose a concussion. It just tells you if you should get a CT, and there's concern for blood on the CT or not. And yeah, so it's so limited. It's, it's limited because mm -hmm. um, again, it's being used. I think in a lot more, like in ERs. Yeah, but as as a re as a replacement yeah. for a CAT scan. Right. So, I mean, which is great, right? Because you have all these kids are getting radiated with CT scans. Anytime someone comes in with a head knock in, uh, 
in a US ER, they get a CAT scan. So it's a great tool to sort of look for blood in the brain, but it's not, it's not anywhere related to making a diagnosis of concussion. Yeah, and with that in mind, you'll see a proliferation of literature that have studies that measure biomarkers and say that's something that's bad. Right. We really don't know what that means. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, I think it's a bit of a mess at the moment. Yep, I agree. I think we're done. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Um, who can use your uh, all of those IOC tests? Is it just a doctor or can the physios and other groups within the team environment use those? Yes, the physios can do it, but if there's going to be an intervention, it should be coming from from licensed professionals, so the physician or the mental health professional. And I think um, I I think one of the lessons that I really want to drive home um, is. Really, if you see something, report it. Talk to the person. Um, I am from the University of Virginia. Um, 24 hours ago, we had a shooting. Um, three of my athletes were killed. Um, one is in the OR, and an hour ago, they had the candlelight vigil. Um, and it's um, to say it's gutting is it doesn't even remotely address what is happening. So this is a, a topic that, and and I will I will clearly say the shooter was. He was a former football player. He is in custody. He was not currently on the team. We don't know his mental health. We don't know what contributed. What. But to hear, about, to, to hear about this, to understand what the team is going through, um, the athletic trainers, the coaches, the staff, my partner, speaking to these people all night last night on Zoom calls, um, it, is, it is devastating. And one of the questions was, did we miss something? Who saw him? Um, and he had been he had been on a watch list, and he had they had talked about him not being quite right, and um, it, and of course I'm talking about the extreme, um, but if you see something, someone's anxious, someone's changing, just you, you owe it to you owe it to that individual. We're all in healthcare. We need to help each other out, especially during these times where it's just absolutely crazy with COVID and fires and earthquakes and, and what is happening, but we just need to watch out for each other. So it is, you have two options. You've got the SMIRT, which can be used by anyone, but it just it helps underscore, yeah, there is something that might be going on here. I'm gonna help my friend get to the person that might be able to better help them. And then also as physios, that's when their guard comes down. They're spending time with you guys. That's when, when they, that's when I, you know, I use it as when I'm going to physical therapy, I'm using it as, as mental therapy because I'm like, oh my gosh, you should have seen the patient I saw. And, and all of a sudden these things start coming out because you spend time together with this individual. So if something strikes you, act on it. But yeah. And then I think you guys can refer, right? You can refer back to the GP and you have to actually write it in the referral um, if, if an intervention is needed here. Right, Mark? Yeah. 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 <laughs> you were sport New Zealand and you were told you had unlimited resource for pre-season concussion testing. What kind of gambit would you be throwing down, Ray? Um, I think for a high risk sport. For a high risk sport? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly what we do in most of our uh, elite sport in the U.S. and I would put our, some of our colleges so you know, uh, in some of, our, some of our high schools. In that setting, most of them do a baseline neurologic exam as part of the medical exam. Most of them do a baseline SCAT, which, uh, you know, again, has a symptom checklist, has a brief cognitive exam, has a balance exam. Um, the SCAT-6 will probably have um, some more complicated uh, cognitive exams and balance exams. Um, and then um, a lot of the, most of the elite sports also have um, baseline neuropsychological testing and they use a, a, um, just a computerized battery. Uh, if an athlete's had prior concussions, so they'll often perform not only the computerized test, but then also a paper pencil test. And most of the, at least in the United States, most of the, the pro sports like the NHL, the NFL, and, and football, MLS, um, uses the same battery, a hybrid battery. That's, that's all we do. Now, again, you know, Tina can probably talk to 
whether or not, you know, one of my questions to her has always been, you know, how, how abnormal, what's the baseline level of abnormalities in like the visual screening, right? Because we know that anisocoria is there. We know that there's convergence, you know, testing and individuals that have that. So whether or not that would be a, a, a useful ad um, I, th I think I'd, I'd let you address. Yeah, I mean, we would advocate that we would, and we've been doing some work um, looking at that in that um, base rates in the general population of things like convergence insufficiency and accommodative dysfunction and psychotic dysfunction is probably in the single digit percent range. Um, and then when we looked at, you know, non-concussed kids in our emergency departments, um, up to, you know, a quarter of the kids would have um, either symptom provocation or physical signs with some of the visual vestibular exam. But very few of them had two or more um, that would flag as abnormal. And so, again, those are the kinds of things that we would say um, we find useful. So because the visual vestibular exam that we do is free and it takes about three minutes to do, we would say that's a high yield, you know, thing for us. Um, we don't use in our practice anymore neurocognitive testing. And I think the one thing that I would guess I would want to go out there, though, with is that even though you, know, you ask a theoretical question about what you, know, you would do if you had unlimited resources, I think that makes everybody kind of walk away like, well, I just wish we had unlimited resources, which is what everybody wishes. Uh, but then I think parents and families of kids in like regular you know, youth club sport then feel like they're getting like the short shrift. And they're not. Right. Like people come in all the time and they have like an impact test or a neurocognitive test or whatever. And we do the entire history and the physical in the exam and they say, Dr. Master, you haven't looked at his computerized neurocognitive testing score yet at all. I was like, yeah, because I don't need to, right? Like we don't need to have that to make these decisions. And so I don't want like my kids and families to say, oh, we just, you know, have like this really second class, like second tier system. Mm -hmm. They're getting great care. They don't need to have any of that. And actually the study that, um, so Margot and I were both part of the CARE Consortium, which was the largest prospective cohort study of collegiate athletes in the U.S. with 30 um, uh, institutions. And basically, one of the studies that came out of that was that actually the baseline was not useful in um, determining both return to play, injury, you know, anything. It just, and it actually, and it was surprising to us. We didn't expect that. Yeah. We thought that there would be something that would be useful. And really, it found that the entire baseline testing thing actually didn't seem to make a difference at all in terms of, you know, return to play and recovery times, et cetera. So, yeah, I think part of that is based on having, whether you have group-based norms, so in other words, you don't need a baseline if you're if you've got group based norms. Yeah. So you know what your you know collegiate athletes going to score typically on, then you don't need to have their individual individual baseline. You make the argument. I mean, I, I would make the argument that it, it's sometimes useful, especially if it's been done in, yes. in a good, in a systematic fashion. Yeah. That you have that individual's baseline. It's always helpful, but. Yeah. But know. by and large, I think probably you don't need it. Yeah. yeah. So. One thing I was thinking about with regard to that and resourcing, knowing that most of our sports don't have unlimited resources, is that w w that talk that we were just, we've all just come back from a conference in Adelaide. One of the other speakers was a guy called was Roald Barr. And so he was, he was talking about individualizing individual uh, injury prevention strategies for um, elite sport. And so that the, one of the things that a key take home for me is there are, there are a whole lot of things that are good to do for everyone. And, you know, the, just because it's simple, like a Nordic hamstring, doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. So e everyone should do those things. But then there are some people that you're going to throw everything at. So I would say in the, that HPSNZ cohort, the ones that have had lots of concussions before are the ones that you should invest in, you know, a, a fairly comprehensive ocular assessment. Or they should go and see a, a behavioral optometrist or they should go see a neuropsychologist. And so you might have the computer baseline, you might have the SCAT, you might have a, an injury history, but then for those three players that are in the sevens program that you know you're worried about already, throw everything at those guys. And then you have their baseline and then you're making individual decisions for them and then you're saving some cash for your bonus at the end of the year. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's sort of where we are moving to too, yeah. that we, we can't be throwing a blanket over everything, it can't be yep. every sport, uh -huh. every athlete we have to think about. Right. It. And you don't need to, and I don't think you have to feel guilty that you don't either, that's the thing. I, think that, I mean, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the United States what happened was there was a, a lawsuit for, against the university, right, um, for football players, American football, tackle football players. And so what the NCAA ended up doing is saying every athlete, needs to have a baseline that includes, you know, symptoms, cognitive exam, balance. It, it, it was like, so you're telling me that for my tennis players and my golfers, my, you know, like, 
I need to do the same thing that I'm doing for ice hockey and American football and wrestling. Um, so it really was um, problematic. So I, I would not go that route. I would not suggest that. Mm -hmm. no. All right, awesome. Oh, late, late one. Um, just regarding the smack, could you... Um, the wicked smack? The wicked, the wicked the smack. smack. <laughs> could you um, extend it to, I guess, non-elite athletes or a recreational mm -hmm. population who um, is elite in sports and don't take it seriously? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Um, and one thing I didn't point out is it's the SMAT one and the SMART one. So it's the first rendition. So they plan on looking at data. They're collecting data. They're going to make tweaks to it. And but but the the hope is that it's a tool that expands your ability to assess and have it really quite simplistically laid out for you with a series of just a handful of questions here and a handful of questions there to be able to be to to delve into areas that you might need to dive into a little bit more give that person that added minute or two and get them the better care yeah, I mean the APSQ was validated uh, that was actually developed by Simon Rice and uh, Rosie Purcell in Australia uh, and it's only been validated in elite sport um, but it's probably applicable to kids. Absolutely. And then the other tools are ones that are, you know, have been in, around for in primary care and really not validated necessarily in athletes. So the GAD7 and the PHQ9 for anxiety and depression. But those are know, validated in teens. Those are validated right. in, in teens mm -hmm. and the general population. Mm -hmm. they're, they're validated tools. They just haven't been validated in athletes. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason to think that they aren't, you know, athletes are just as likely as non-athletes to have mental health issues, right. and in some situations, more likely. Right. Yep. So anyways, but the other tools, you know, have all, are, all, are all for the most part validated tools, um, and there's a lot of work that's being done all over, all over the world in terms of trying to, to take the SMAT and say, how useful is it, and what would make it better? What would make it better? Cool, hey, well, um, maybe just join with me to say thanks. <laughs>